Hey there. If you want to help out this show and this network, consider going over to duckfeed.tv slash tip jar. There you will find a link to amazon.com. If you click that and then go about your regular shopping, uh, you can support us because we get a small cut of the proceeds of whatever you buy. It's like an affiliate style thing. So if you're going to be going and buying the rest of the Dark Tower series or other Stephen King books or other books or anything at all, uh, consider doing that. Uh, it's a small extra step that makes a huge difference for us. Again, that is duckfeed.tv slash tip jar. Thank you. Welcome to Radio Free Midworld, a podcast about the Dark Tower series of books. My name is Cole Ross, and today I am joined by Jeremy Greer. Hello, hello. And by Patty Smith. Good evening. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, hopping on here to talk about chapter number two in The Wastelands, continuing um, into book number three here. Um, what is rapidly turning out and reminding me, like, hey, this is one of the best books in the series. Uh, if not the best, but they're all, you know, I, I like all of my children. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, 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 it's hard. I, I'm really enjoying kind of going back to this, even though I just, uh, I, I just read all of these, you know, n n no more than, uh, like eight months ago when the, when, when the show got funded. Um, yeah. So, uh, what made the two of you sign up for this particular chapter looking at, um, key and Rose here? Uh, talking about kind of Jake's journey after being kind of metaphysically saved. Um, Jeremy, you, you jumped on this one pretty quick. I did. Uh, I just wanted to jump in on the wastelands, and I thought that people might have been tired of me being on the first episode of every book. So <laughs> I went to the second one. Yeah. Um, the Wastelands is, is probably my favorite book out of the series. Um, I I know a lot of people seem to really like Wizards in Glass. Um, I know a lot of people like some, some – the very beginning, the very first one. But uh, at this reread – Wizards and Glass is just cemented as my favorite book. So, um, you yeah, mean the I signed up for the. What did I say? Wizards and Glass. I meant. Yeah. I definitely meant the Wastelands. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> um, it, it's just it, it moves so much plot. It goes so quickly. The it's so much fun. The the stuff that we're going to do today, which is mostly Jake. I was uh I was telling Patty on, uh, earlier today that I'm pretty sure that I read all of this around the time that um, I was Jake's age. Like I was trying to put it together, like if seventh and eighth grade would have been 11 or 12 for me. And yeah. uh, identified very strongly with Jake and kind of still do. I kind of still want to be cool ass Jake because I think cool. <laughs> I think Jake is way cooler than I am even now. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's uh, I, I can say that. I can say that for sure, at least about myself. I, I, it sounded mm -hmm. like I was about to dunk on you, but no, I will dunk on myself for that. <laughs> Patty, how about you? What made you hop on this section? Jake's really cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I really like like the side story stuff. Uh, like when we when we get to Wizard and Glass, like um, I think that's my favorite book so far, Wizard and Glass, because most of it is side story, which I really, really, really liked. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'll tell you what my favorite book is in about a week when I finish the series because I finished off Song of Susanna today. Oh yeah. Um, cause I've been kind of catching back up again and I thought, do I wait? Cause I've read, you know, I've, I, I read the, re the extra chapters for this <laughs> and I was kind of a, a few chapters away at the end. I thought, do I wait until we've done this podcast and then get back in? And the book was just staring at me. I'm like, okay, yeah, come back here book. Let me read you now. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I love this. This whole chunk of the book is so different. And the fact that it explores, like you were saying on the last episode that, that Roland's having this sort of duality in his brain, but it's expressed better here. Mm -hmm. And I really like the way that it all eventually will unfold. Yeah. Um, it's really great, you know, and, and not to get too far ahead, but, you know, we are talking about Jake's Jake's story in this. It's really great to get his perspective on things because, you know, Stephen King hasn't really written this character, you know, since The Gunslinger. And it's been, you know, by all rights, about 15 years, um, 10 or 15 years since he actually touched this. And so I think that Jake is much more developed, um, especially as we get this, uh, you know, this sense of him, you know, kind of at his at his worst a little bit um you know uh, in terms of dissatisfaction with the quote unquote real world um and also kind of under the under this duress like this is a very uh kind of like metaphysically upsetting chapter and like to see you know to see him go through that it kind of does a really good job of like reintroducing you to who Jake Chambers is 
definitely. Because before he was just that weird Agreed. kid who he, measured he... time in poop. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I uh, I really felt like Jake um, was when I was thinking about this before I actually reread it. Uh, I was thinking that Jake felt he was way more advanced in his years than he actually was, and and he is to a degree, but. Rereading it this time, I'm I'm kind of just in sync with them. Like I could I could see an 11 year old kid bouncing around New York doing the things that we're gonna see. Mm-hmm. So I'm, man, I'm I am so excited to talk about this. I I reread this couple of chapters right before the show because mm-hmm. I just kind of wanted to refresh myself. It had been about month or two, month or two, and uh, it was all I could do not to just keep reading, <laughs> keep finish the book. So. <laughs> it's it's really hard. I did this one on 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 audiobook over the past uh, like uh, two days or so, and it was very difficult for me to not just continue listening, um, and instead have to go back and uh, you know like actually put, commit the notes. That keeps happening to me as well. Yeah. Like you get to the, oh, that was really good. I should read it. No, no. <laughs> no. Like, your notes now. <laughs> Discipline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get into it. So last time, um, you know, we started uh, the Wastelands with Roland, Eddie, and Susanna, uh, kind of recovering from their uh, kind of excursion on the western shore. Um, and Roland has been teaching them the way of the gunslinger. There were there there were two main kind of big events here. Uh, the first of which was encountering this large robotic bear who is a guardian of the beam. Uh, the beam, you know, is something that is of the tower and will lead them to the tower. So, hey, we found our road, uh, yellow brick or otherwise. Um, and they also uh, had a small encounter um, after uh, Roland has described him feeling like he is two people in one body um, because the events of the, uh, the drawing of the three have left him in a state of both, and this is complicated to summarize, sorry if I'm tripping over it, um, left him in a state where he has memories of rescuing a small boy um, and also not encountering the small boy. Um, and we're going to see the other side of that um, as Eddie has started whittling this key that will eventually save their lives and have its twin um, in something we're going we're to see in this chapter. Man, that was a mess. But it's probably it's really hard though, Pro- isn't it? Like <laughs> yeah. time yeah. travel's like difficult. Like he's <laughs> he's paradoxed himself. Yeah, yeah. Just he, he, so so uh, both Roland and Jake are are uh, living in a paradox where um, Jake is is both alive and dead at the same time. Is is probably the the, the simplest way to put that. And that's kind of where we begin um, with. Jake's last day at school at this really uh, prestigious uh, place that his dad is really proud to have sent him to this Piper Academy, right? The Piper School. Um, and we're in media arrest. It's been three weeks, you know, since Jake was supposed to have died. And he is also, you know, l- losing his mind because of the schism in this reality. Um, I'm not familiar with, with with nice schools. Like I went to an OK, like city public school. Piper School sounds like hell. <laughs> <laughs> i went to a private school um, okay. for a couple of years until um i was v- i was came very close to being expelled and only avoided that because uh i had a pretty serious accident at the end of my um sophomore year oh. so i ended up just going into the hospital for a while um i didn't go to a private school like this uh like we didn't have to get dressed up and we didn't have fancy names for cafeterias like we didn't have outs in the uh whatever like we just had tuna casserole in the calf like like jake mentions um but it's it was really weird like everybody at that school kind of just had a a degree of like we're cooler people because we go to the school yeah so it's private school is like this weird kind of closed economy like it was k through 12 and it was probably 500 students max which is extremely small for louisiana um for for comparison the school that I actually graduated high school from had 300 students in his graduating class. And that okay. was just in the senior year. Hmm. So uh, it's, this stuff is, is really, really, it, it makes me remember that, but it's, it's kind of that thing where you, you read something and Stephen King's so good at writing it. And he's so good at creating this place that I just automatically remember it this way, as opposed to the way it actually was, <laughs> if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it taps into the, to, to this kind of like paragon um, of, uh, of, of what that experience would have been. Yeah, I would have enjoyed that. I th- it sounds good to me. <laughs> I I grew up ginger, very ginger. Okay, and uh, in I don't want to say rough because you know where I where I used to live isn't isn't rough. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, it was. Um, are you aware of the British um word chav? Chav. That's like um like yes. a, like a, like a street t- a street tough, right? 
no, no, not like it's not like a street tough like rolling around like gang member, but like kind of it's it's oh. it's kind of a kind of shorthand for like a like a relatively low class uh yeah, kind of sorry, person. I, I got like West Side Story there, like just the yeah, gangs of yeah. guys walking out and clicking their hands together <laughs> in time. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah, it was it was Chav before Chav was a thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a council estate sort of place where we used to live, and it was, you know, not not the classiest area, let's be mm-hmm. fair. Um, it, it was, you know, okay. But you know, don't don't grow up, Ginger. In, in, a, low, in, in a private in a public school, it's not it's not good. It's not yeah. the best. See, I really I really feel like uh, th- th- this is okay. So this is an undertone for the entire show. But between between you you Patty uh, me and then and then Autumn, we have we have redheaded people represented. I think disproportionately to the uh, you know compared to the entire population. I didn't come by yeah. it honest. I was blonde um, until I was in, oh. in, in until like uh, until like junior year of high school. <laughs> Oh. I like how Patty got excited at that fact. Oh, really? Cool. You Tell me more. One. <laughs> yeah. No, I just uh, just uh, just had oh, so just had fun here. One of the ginger vampires got you then one night, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because we can't go out in the day. Mm-hmm. It was just a cloud of freckles uh, that, that that appeared from a sewer grate, and then and, and then took me down. No. <laughs> and a smell of sunscreen. <laughs> Is that copper tone in the air? Ah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no no it just uh it had blonde hair and then it just darkened and by the time i went to college people were saying hey you're ginger i'm like no i'm, not. I'm, a, I'm fucking blonde I'm like no no you're not um and i think i'm still in some denial but i've so so i've got this now and i i, I i'm kind of like a day walker almost i didn't have yeah. to i didn't have to put in those those hard knocks like you did those 11 year old dues yeah no yeah man 12, 11 to 12 was probably the worst i got over it when i was 13 it's like you know what? this is fine i'm all right with this i <laughs> Never got beaten up. The worst that happened was someone threw a shoe at me once, which was fine. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Happened around the time of Austin Powers, so all I could think of was, who throws a shoe? And it's got funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I, sh- I should mention this because uh, Autumn won't have a chance to because you're going to be, this is the only time we're going to see uh, the Piper School. Uh, she actually went to an extremely private school in Louisiana with like, I think there were like 12 people that she graduated with. It was ridiculous. So this is, I'd like to, I should have gotten her opinion on this before we recorded, but she's been out of town working for a living while yeah. I've been recording podcasts. So <laughs> just let her do that. <laughs> I think, I don't think 12 people is a school. I think that's a cult. Yeah, it, it, it sounds like it, it sounds a lot like a cult when she describes it, to be honest with you. That's they pretty... have to wear cloaks. <laughs> I mean, they didn't have to, yeah. but there were no chavs around. So nobody made fun of them and, and, and knocked out of, you know, knocked it out of them. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> so, like the so the Piper School um, just kind of exists like as this proxy, as this go between. It is kind of the only thing that his dad knows or cares about him. Um, you know, J- J- Jake, as we learned in the uh, in in the first book, has a really bad relationship with his parents. His mom is pretty much absent, and his dad is kind of a hard case who um, works for a television network and is a master of the kill, uh, and does a lot of coke and just generally is uh, an executive in seventies New York City. Um, and so, it's a shit human. Oh yeah, not 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 bad person. Not really knocking it out of the park in terms of being a good father. Um, and in and in other 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 kind of areas, and so like <laughs> his dad, you know, ag- again, the only thing that he knows about his son is that he goes here, says, "Oh, money won't get you into Piper School. It's what you got going on in your, in your brain." And Jake's like, "No, that's not true. You yeah. you paid to, <laughs> you, you paid to send me here." And, and it actually costs twenty two thousand dollars a year to go here. Like yeah. that's insane. <laughs> twenty two thousand in 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 nineteen seventy seven dollars, which I think is one point five million today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably close. I like as well that that he's uh, that, that Jake's not actually like his given name. Like his name's John, right? right. And like only like four, what three or four people call him Jake. <laughs> I think that's what the book says. So I'm like only a few of his friends call him Jake, and his dad wouldn't like that name if he heard it. No, no, because he's John, and we we called you yeah. John because it's a it's a good and proper name for a you know for 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 a Milford man. You always know you always know a Piper man. <laughs> <laughs> because they speak french and know where their daddy's cocaine is that's how you know a piper man yeah. I, I really like the uh representation of jake's dad here like i love uh i know he's he's a shit guy don't get me wrong i don't like the dude yeah. but um the repetition of like the factoid and jake thinking and if my dad knew that little factoid he'd blow his top or whatever mm-hmm. uh I, and i just there's stephen king does an amazing job and he books like needful things and it of creating these characters basically out of whole cloth mm-hmm. and they stick with you forever. And it seems like 
you know, there's there's a lot of books out there, and I read, I, we consume a lot of media, but Jake's dad sticks out with me for some reason, just as being this terrifying, overbearing presence, which. I, I don't know, man. Like I just like it's just so good. <laughs> like, yeah, I, 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 <laughs> it's it, it's one of those things, right? Like one of my favorite uh, quotes from King of the Hill is like, "I didn't know it was possible to feel both violated and ignored at the same time." Like mm-hmm. how can how how can Jake be? You know, how, how can Jake's dad, Elmer, and which okay, Elmer, that's pretty funny, um, be so tyrannical, but also just completely ignore Jake? Like like the thing that sticks out for me in this is just his complete, like Jake's complete isolation. I mean, you made the Milford man joke, but this this that actually is a testament to Jake of how he's basically invisible to his parents. And sure, his parents are to blame for part of it, but Jake does such a real, real great job of just making himself invisible as well. He he do, he makes good grades. He makes perfect grades. So there's nothing mm-hmm. like he doesn't get in trouble. His you know he never asks for anything extravagant. He's just kind of existing in this world without yeah. any kind of static or friction at all. So. I think the only reason he hasn't really run up against his dad is because he hasn't <clears throat> turned into a horrible teenager like we all do in a couple of years <laughs> oh, of from Jake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's I mean, kept his head down. He's got on with his life. He's just tried not to make too much exactly. of a scene. Yeah. <laughs> and Jake's going to do his horrible teenage years, um, you know, his his violent and moody side, um, you know, in a different world. So it's not really going to matter too much. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but of all the worlds that kind of become violent and moody, what a world. Yeah, of course. <laughs> That's the best place. <laughs> if you're going to go teenage crazy, do it in Midworld. Like, yep. I can see that travel poster that's put up somewhere. <laughs> Mid- Midworld, the place for teenage crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, kind of not, though, because there are no teens to go crazy, as we're going to see later in the book. Um, that's, that's the secret. <laughs> Yeah, but um, you know he's so but he's so incredibly isolated, and he's got this crisis going on. You know, like a literal. You know, for all he knows, he is legitimately going going insane, right? Where he has this fix- fixation on you know being you know did I die? Did I live? Um, he has these voices. You know, um, he has this uh, kind of like juxtaposition, like oh, money won't get you into the Piper School, um, alongside money won't get you into the Sunnyvale Psychiatric Hospital. You know, like the entire. The entire chapter, at least the parts that are about this, you know, leans into that duality angle really, really heavily. And he is so isolated that he has nobody to really go to. Like, even the person that he, that he is closest to in the in the entire world, um, you know, Miss Greta Shaw, you know, uh, Gobama Roll Tide, um, is, you know, he, he can only, <laughs> like, he still speaks to her in lies. He still hides what's going on, you know, and, uh, you know, obfuscates, right? Pretty tricky something mm-hmm. to bring up though it is yeah <laughs> i think i'm dead but i'm not <laughs> huh <laughs> um and there, there, there's something that happens later on that actually like i was reading this uh i was i weren't li- reading it i was listening to it yesterday and it kind of like choked me up when there when there were people who cared about him and it was his teachers <laughs> yeah yeah. yeah, the letters that he gets um, towards the end of this, the, the section that we're covering are um, extremely, extremely affecting to me. Like just having somebody in Jake's life to actually care what the hell this kid is doing and actually care about him as a human being. Mm-hmm. When up to that point, really the only person that's cared about him has been Roland. And uh, as we know, Roland is not the best babysitter, as we've <laughs> discussed many times. Yep. Even his, uh, even his, and I, we'll probably get to this in a minute, but like even his... Um, not not babysitter, but his uh, maid person that lives mm-hmm. in the not lives in the house, but his parents have hired. Like even like, like she's just there for the job. Like she doesn't really particularly care. She just is there all the time, mostly. Yeah, yeah. Like he's she she's just another teacher, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, saying that there there is a girl in his class, you know, gets a bit gets a bit <laughs> fresh with oh, yeah. um, <laughs> when he, he, he so when he's in the class and he, he decides to go and open the closet door because he he thinks because he's become so fixated with doors. You know, he thinks he's going to open one and it's going to be Midworld. He's going to be back. He's yeah, yeah. And he'll yeah. do it. And he goes into the supply closet and he's like, this time, this time we're going to get there. And we're going to, and he opens it and it's just a supply closet. And all the kids kind of laugh at him. And there's one girl who's like, hey, maybe I'll go in there with you next time. Huh? Yeah. Isn't he 11? <laughs> <laughs> he's, he, he's 11, but, uh, but girls mature quicker than boys. And, and that actually like rung a little bit true. A, 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 a little bit that, you know, maybe a girl at 11 would be, would be more interested in making out than you know the, the, the than him and jake's complete obliviousness and also just <laughs> embarrassment like that captures that age pretty well i think i thought that was a that was a really good piece of color 19 Maybe minutes just... in heaven am i right <laughs> yeah exactly 
<laughs> Maybe it just shows like the kind of um, like self esteem I had growing up. But I always thought that girls matured faster than boys. But they didn't want to go make out. They just wanted you to think that they wanted you to go make out with you, and then made fun of you for it. Like, that's is that that's <laughs> yeah. kind of what I thought. And then they locked you in the cupboard, <laughs> and they call you a nerd. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank God Reddit didn't exist when we were when we were little. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. I would like to talk to both of you about something called the red pill. Yes. Yes. Have you? <laughs> Are have you, you ready? <laughs> I know you're not yet a man, but when you become a man, would you like to go your own way? <laughs> oh gosh but you bring up a good point patty you're moving us along which is so yeah which is which is useful um jake is fixated on doors you know much like uh both eddie and Susanna came to midworld through you know through a door you know jake is hoping that you know whatever door he opens up will kind of function the same as the door of death you know when he died in that in that timeline that didn't happen um, you know, uh, he's hoping that when he opens it up, he will go to the way station that he will go to Midworld and meet Roland because he has kind of this longing to be reunited and to bring the, uh, to bring the timelines together. Um, and so this manifests both as him opening up doors, um, and eventually later, later on going into the girl's bathroom because he, uh, he believes that, uh, um, you know, he'll find his way in, in, in there. Um, and when I was listening to this, uh, all I could think of, uh, have either of you watched the, uh, the, the, uh, the new twin peaks? No, no, no. 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 Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. the, 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 there is a visual thing that happens in, uh, like episode three and four that, uh, uh, that, that, that calls that calls that, but like, I just picture, you know, Jake seeing a door and then having a, like a light, like, like a light appear over top of it and just like, I've got to run. I've got to, I've got to go through that. And then nothing. It's like a really extreme version of the waiting for the post thing. Like, oh, I wonder if it was today. Oh, there goes the post. Oh, it's not one. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And then my Lego starting at every up. like starting at every like truck you hear drive by, right? Oh, I was like, yeah, is that yeah. is that the FedEx truck to bring me my, my favorite video game ever? No, no, yeah. no. It's just no. the name. Yeah, yeah. I'll your person. Never mind. <sighs> See, it, like somewhere along the line, along the line, I became even more broken of a person because I started being able to differentiate UPS, USPS, and FedEx trucks by the uh, by the sound of their engine. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. that's good uh me and my me and my ups driver are on a texting relationship so if i have something special i just text him and i go meet him somewhere early oh that's smart Weird. that's really smart yeah. out of context that sounded great <laughs> <laughs> hey a little something special i'll meet you around the corner uh-huh. meet you around the corner hey come on larry you know what i'm looking for <laughs> <laughs> big, big up to Larry. I think uh, I, I think the, uh, the the UPS driver is the new priest in terms of like yeah. how important mm. this uh, the, this community fixture is in our lives, and, and also the person we confess our sins to. Yeah. <laughs> How, how nervous are you guys when he opens up this blue folder and sees just all of this nonsense on the page? Because every time I read this passage, it just makes me so nervous. I almost break out in sweats. Like I've been, I get so tense when I have to do public speaking or I have to hand something in. Nowadays, I'm doing like like, like bid projects that I have to get submit submit to engineers who are much smarter than I am. They're going to review it, so I get like nervous. So I'm just thinking to myself like I open up a bid and I just see like a the Leaning Tower of Pisa colored black, and I'm like, oh my god. But how did this happen? <laughs> I get terrified. It's, well, it's the nightmare, isn't it? It's uh-huh. the classic school nightmare of, oh, God, I've not I've not revised. I've got the test. I've not done the work. I'm wearing my pants. Oh, no, I didn't get <laughs> no. dressed this morning. It, it's that, but, like, magnified. Like, the idea that he's – because, like, he, you look at it and, like, you recognize your own handwriting. I think that's the scary part. Like, mm-hmm. I, I wrote this, did I? Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> how drunk was I? I, I, can't, I can't account for this time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm 11, so it would only take, like, one drink. But <laughs> how drunk was I? Why have I got mashed off my tits and colored in a tower? What is, why is there a train in here? Yeah. What was I doing? And also, why is my UPS driver bringing me a lot of Amazon boxes that I don't remember ordering? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, it, the modern it, version it, of this is waking that. up hungover and just looking at all the tweets you sent last night going, oh, oh God, Jesus. no. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. no. Yeah. <laughs> just look back at my Google search history. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta expunge that. Nope. I need to just move on to a new identity. I need to fake my own death. All right, new computer. Just burn it all. <laughs> yeah, like it is. It is a living anxiety dream. Not not only does he um, believe that he didn't do the assignment, but he looks at it and realizes that yes, I did do it. I do not remember doing it, and it is complete nonsense. <laughs> um, like that is. Uh, oh my gosh, it's like the canonical um, anxiety dream, right? One that I still have. 
actually like not the not the mm-hmm. whole I'm, I'm naked in school thing but like i will this is a weirdly confessional episode i will have dreams that like oh <laughs> there was there was one high school class that you actually didn't pass so you have to go back like a billy madison or a back to school kind of thing and then also i didn't study for it like and that is tied up with this notion that like oh i'm not as smart as i used to be so this is going to be really hard <laughs> Yeah, it's it's like that, this kind of stuff is always terrifying for me, like any yeah. kind of form of, uh, you know, basically public review, right? Like anytime I'm going to be judged in public is is kind of scary and breaks me out. And like I said, the sweats when I read this and it's like if you just read this and, and we have some really good conclusion to this later. But like for now, <laughs> you read this and you're like, what in the hell? Like, yeah, we all know what this is about. Yeah. But Jake doesn't know anything about the prisoner or the lady <laughs> or Blaine. Like, we don't know who Blaine is and Blaine keeps brought up like several times, but yeah. we don't know what we don't we know what some of this about. Jake is looking at this and going like, What the hell is this? And it has to be so terrifying for him. Yeah, it looks like the scrawlings of the, of a of a madman. So like on the cover there's a there's a uh, a couple of photographs, one of a train and one of the leaning tower of Pisa with you know that is uh, covered over black uh, with crayon and then the entire thing is this kind of like stream of consciousness poetry that is you know mostly stuff that we have seen from midworld right so talking about the gunslinger talking about the prisoner the lady of shadows um and it's kind of because the uh because the the, the theme of the essay was hey what is truth like everything is appended with and this is the truth and then it starts spinning off into things that we haven't seen so far. So like Jeremy said, references somebody named Blaine. So, you know, Blaine is a pain, you know, and that mm-hmm. is the truth, you know, that, that, that is a, the, the truth. And then to top everything off, it is punctuated with choo, 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 um, you know, written out. And also for good measures, we have quotes from T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland and also um, Child Roland, The Dark Tower Came. You know, as it, uh, of course as, we do. <laughs> as it <goes>. cool. <laughs> yeah. So, so here we have Jake just kind of reprising, I believe, the outline from uh, Stephen King's writing of the book. Um, and out of context, all of it looks like the gibbering of you know the gibberings of a madman, not a uh, final essay for an English class. Mm. On on first read, I I think I remember stopping at this bit and just staring at it for a while. <laughs> trying to glean some oh, yeah, let's be like trying to glean some truth out of it like yeah. so blaine who blaine <laughs> is this the, is, is could this be i think what, what was i trying to think i remember we were thinking could he be another name for the man in black like what's what's that mean like there's mm-hmm. there's so much there that's just completely out there that you know we'll make context later and i think having now read it the second time uh yesterday like ah Ah, this bit's quite clever isn't it yeah it's uh it's mm-hmm. it's it's all there because you have but to on that first read past the eighth line just don't just take it in but you're not going to get it no no it just uh just just like, revel put like yourself in jake's shoes right? yeah, yeah exactly um but remember you know jake uh he has he has the touch um he has the power um and the movie version of this is you know it's it's, it's straight up just the shine he's got the shining right so like what he's experiencing, um, you know, be, be because of just something about him is premonition, right? Mm. And so, like, the, the that is how he is pulling pulling this stuff out, and like, eventually, like, this is going to become a little bit of a rubric, um, and lines from this are going to be, you know, repeated um, in his kind of own internal monologue, you know, going going out into the future, and he will recall that, and it'll help him out of situations. Mm. I saw a good yeah, parallel yeah. with this and uh, the Odetta Detta situation in the last book mm-hmm. when, like, he clearly wrote this <laughs> at some point. He doesn't remember doing it. Did he Did he go go strange for a while and not remember it in the same way that Detta and Odetta would, like, ignore each other a little bit? Like, I know it's not the same thing, but it, it kind of flashed back. And yeah. gave me it's like automatic writing when you just kind of turn your brain off and let your hand move on the page and see what comes out. And that's supposed yeah. to be special. Yep. Um, I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. Especially when he has a confirmed psychic. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Not one of those terrible ones that come around and say that they can talk to your dead relatives and they're not. They just look at your Facebook page. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> don't worry about the money. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Woo. Woo. Man. Uh, i really like the the idea of a shitty clairvoyant looking at your facebook page like on their phone underneath the table while they're telling your future like i see that you just took a recent trip did you spend a lot of money (laughs) yes don't worry about the dark souls it'll be fine 
<laughs> so yes, when you were on your way over here, you were listening to Motley Crue. Yes, okay. <laughs> that's exactly right. I, I very much enjoy that uh, Jake's like psychic power actually works through the worlds. So, like I like that the mm-hmm. strength of this quartet is is such that even through the doors of this universe, like he's not even like even physically in front of a door through the universe, but mm-hmm. like it's it tells me that the world that the tower is holding together is are slowly starting to kind of commingle a little bit. And we, we see that throughout the series, but I think this psychic power, the Shinnin, if you will, or mm-hmm. this, like Jake has with the, the rest of the content working right here is kind of a symptom of that. Yeah. And I think that's really, really fun. Like it's a, it's, it's just fun. Like it just makes me, it makes me want to know everything about mid world and all <laughs> of this world and how all of this works. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a different interpretation of like a chosen one or something like that. You know, like it is it is less out of destiny, but out of duty, you know, like that he that he exists as this conduit, you know, and it's because he, you know, has this relationship with, uh, you know, other people in Roland's past. Yeah. Um. So he sees this uh, he sees this essay and he decides, yep, I need to bug out. So he gets up, excuses himself to go to the restroom and instead leaves school uh, behind. Um, Before he goes, though, he goes in the girl's bathroom and says one of my favorite lines in the whole book. Like, what are you doing in here? And he says, I thought it was the desert. <laughs> Go on, my son. <laughs> because why not? That's that, that that is as good of an excuse as any. <laughs> yeah. What else can you say to get out of it? Oh, uh, 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 I thought it was the desert. <laughs> and then he, just leave. Well, I think he makes it worse. He says, uh, Any, Anything to have to stop looking at this. Sorry, <laughs> No, I think he even says, oh, I went through the wrong door. I thought this was the desert or something like yeah. that. Yeah. I'm mm-hmm. good. Which it was the wrong door. He, he had a misconception. <laughs> <laughs> he just says anything to stop himself from seeing this woman um or this girl like popping her pimples in the ladies bathroom <laughs> like <laughs> oh yeah just get yeah. the hell out <laughs> but I, I like that he takes that that step of like nah i'm done i'm out <laughs> i'm out he, like, he gets to the door he's like well i'm truant now i've uh, done it now yes. i'm just gonna go i'm i'm, I'm out Let's screw it and, and then again he just comes out with just the great line just like where's the fucking door go on jake <laughs> Yep. <laughs> so, yep, yep, Johnny is truant. Um and as he kind of goes around um and you know just uh, uh, eventually wanders to where he's going to end up, he starts to kind of recall this day 3 week 3 3 weeks ago when he should have died. Um and we get this scene of him we get the scene of him recalling or foreseeing his death in kind of perfect detail. He knows that uh, for example, that hot dog vendor is going to, you know, take a drink from Yoohoo out of a bottle instead of instead of out of a can. Mm. Uh, you know, he knows that like, oh, that person is the person who's going to throw up. You know, it's going to be this this kind of car. And he has these kind of like moments of expecting the push and then like even staggering forward as he, you know, feels it having supposed to have happened. But there was actually nothing. And like somebody even catches him, you know, and, and, and keeps him from going out into the road. The way this this little mini chapter is written with the steady countdown, uh, mm-hmm. Stephen King says, you know, Jake is 900 seconds from his from from dying, and then he looks into a he looks into a display case, and then he's 720 seconds from dying. Um, it really works for me, but it seems like it's something that was written before all of this other Jake stuff that we read before this, right? Like it just seems like it's almost out of place. I can very much see Stephen King writing this and then putting it right here after this because this is where it fit better. Mm. Because it it, it seems it feels just kind of tonally different with the the seconds countdown. I don't know if it, that it doesn't bother me, so I don't want to say it, like it doesn't bother either of you. But did either one of you notice anything kind of off about it? Um, I it bothered me enough that I had to sit down and work out how many sec uh, how many minutes fifteen hundred seconds was. Uh, in my notes, Excellent. I have got a bit of division. <laughs> just trying to work it like oh twenty five minutes. Just say that. Yeah. <laughs> don't make me think. This is hard enough. Like, <laughs> this gave me a goddamn nonsense poem, and now you want me to do math. This is actually like school. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. I did school once. I don't need to do it again. That's why I won't play Persona 4. <laughs> I, I did school. <laughs> yeah. Um, it didn't bother me too much. I think, I think uh, you know, three weeks is not enough to do a flashback um, in, in, in my head. Uh, so mm-hmm. like it just that the, there was barely enough kind of difference to that. So like there's a little bit of confusion around it, um, but like that th- that whole thing, I could totally see him starting that because like this is the part that he is re envisioning. It's kind of the core of Jake's experience, and it's the first the first thing that we've seen of him outside of him almost killing Roland with his own gun. You know, like we you know that that incredibly vivid image 
of, you know, Roland hypnotizing Jake and then talking about like, oh, I could taste my own shit because my intestines were rolled over, you know, stuff like that. So like I could see him starting this um, and saying like, hey, this is the moment that would have happened otherwise. And we need to reimagine this with the new with the new Jake. Right. And then Mm -hmm. putting everything else around it. Um, The countdown thing just seemed like a cute device to me. Yeah. And all, and also to show like that he it's it's a little bit like uh I don't know. I I feel shitty making a reference to this, but like uh Boondock Saints with uh with Willem <laughs> Dafoe going around and then like reenacting the crime as a as as it happens and stuff like mm-hmm. yes, this mm-hmm. is this is how on lock his kind of premonition of this is. You know, he's got it timed out like it's a like it's a Swiss watch. M- much it's like Fight Club. It's totally okay to like Boondock Saints as long as uh, you stopped liking it when you were twenty. That's the rule on Boondock Saints in Fight Club. I don't, I don't know if you, I don't know if you knew that or not. It's, it's okay to reference that you've seen it. Though. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I saw Boondock, uh, Boondock Saints uh, once when I was uh, when I was seventeen, and I thought, "Huh, that's interesting." And then and then let it go. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's a good rule. I think I think uh, there there are a lot of things that are excusable. I think that twenty is uh, twenty is a good cutoff for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for that 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 absolution. Yeah, if anybody has any questions on when they should stop talking about movies, just just ask me on Twitter. I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> I am the arbiter of all of that. So that's, that's my job in the world. When do we stop talking about Star Wars? <laughs> Whatever Gary tells us to. <laughs> um, but um but yeah so <laughs> any other thoughts on this uh on this on this kind of premonition scene god it must suck right yeah like just the way that it kind of it, the countdown works you know in seconds fine whatever that's fine right in minutes be a real person um the way it came out and he he sort of feels it coming like that crushing inevitability that something bad's coming right now and like mm-hmm. we've all you know i have felt that feeling every just once or twice you think something terrible is coming something bad is happening i've got a very very bad feeling but like but he's having the memories that mm-hmm. it has already happened it's yeah. so weird yeah he's uh he's running <laughs> in before it's happened as well like he knows what's going to happen a little bit ahead of time because i think this is when it first starts the duality starts isn't it like this corner here yes mm-hmm. yeah uh sure. he's just regular normal just normal boy up to this point um uh, it, it, do you think maybe it's when because i know that that roland obviously goes through the door and ends up inside of jack moore yes is that the trigger maybe for jake's sudden death like car going on in his head like i die here do you oh. think that's the moment like because it, does, it yeah, starts that's the, before, doesn't it? that's the trap right that's what walter has set for him right it, yeah that, 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 that's what walter has set for him the the yeah. uh the, the 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 trick is though that roland's killed jack well before he was actually going to kill jake that's a confusing mm. sentence um <laughs> he, he, he he jumped into uh he, he jumped into jack mort's um mind during one of his uh kind of practice runs you know stalking mm. stalking jake you know and getting you know, and getting a sense for his routine as he was getting ready to go bowling so i think that um you know to, uh, R- Roland going in and killing killing Jack well before he actually would have killed Jake was the thing that caused it but him not but uh, Jake not dying at the scheduled time was the point when it definitively split mm. okay that helps because I was a little confused on the timeline on that bit so that helps <laughs> I was I was confused I've read these books uh three times now and working on working on the fourth I literally just worked worked out that that is exactly the uh, the sequence of events <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure somebody somewhere has made an actual timeline of this but i've never bothered to search it out but I, it's always been very confusing to me where um jake is a young child and eddie is a young child versus where they get where they pull from and where Susanna gets pulled from and what the overlap is and all of mm-hmm. that stuff so uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm always in a perpetual state of confusion and there in this section i just i don't care because it's so good it's so much fun <laughs> to read that i'm just like let's go to yep. the next section <laughs> <laughs> it just, as, as long as this works in gestalt it's fine like just let me unfocus mm-hmm. my eyes. It'll 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 be okay. Um, so, like anybody who uh, just uh, just lived through and foresaw their own death, he decides to go bowling, um, and he rolls very badly. Um, but um, you know he 
So I was like, yeah, okay, well, this is the, this is gonna suck. I, I love the uh, I love the, uh, the the lane attendant. Uh, his line when Jake says, "Yeah, I'm not feeling very good." He says, "Oh, go home and drink lots of clear wi- clear liquids. You know, like a uh, vodka or gin or whatever." Like this guy's got a good sense for kids. <laughs> <laughs> I heard He's this 11. so much so much <laughs> growing up as a child. Like that was the thing that all of my. Like any kind of older person, if they found out I was sick, that 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 was always the joke to go to. Like so, when I read this as a as, as a kid, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, this is how normal people talk. <laughs> <laughs> really, people said that. I thought this was just a, a fun little Stephen Kingism. No, so oh no, this. I don't know if it's a southern thing. It might be a southern thing or something. But uh, yeah, this is definitely something I heard a lot growing up. Yeah. I, I say this. I have said this to people before, like because it's just you know when people say jokes to you, you automatically repeat oh, yeah. them to other people because we're all garbage. So it's yeah, it's just something that kind of gets yeah. I, I did. I do like that Jake wants to be a professional bowler when he grows up. Mm-hmm. Like that's a that's that's a cool thing. And I really, again, he, you know, if my dad knew about that little factoid, like it's just uh, that the re- the repetition of his dad just kind of being this overbearing presence in his mind, and he mm-hmm. always has to walk the straight and narrow, or else his his dad is going to notice him. Basically, is very very good. Yeah, I mean, in a way, his dad is his uh, his Henry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, but so, so Jake's fixation on bowling and keeping track of his average and stuff, that is such a seventies thing. I know I mentioned this in, uh, in, in, when we were talking about book one, but it's like that, 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 that pins this down in a particular era. Uh, you know, when, uh, when, 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 it, bo- it, what is it? Did it pins it, 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 yeah, uh, it pins it uh, down. Okay. Yep. There we go. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> yeah. That, that, thank you for pointing that out because I totally did not do that intentionally. <laughs> <laughs> um but when he gets home he has his first door compulsion and he scares the shit out of uh greta um so whoops and so like all of this you know the events of his own death and the events um in midworld keep on repeating for him on a loop for three whole weeks um so he is simultaneously living two very different lives one of which is you know cataclysmic and bookended by um, different deaths, you know, by, by two different deaths, uh, one of which is very, you know, uh, let's say prosaic, you know, going to the Piper school and dealing with his bad parents and things like that. And that is what gets him to the point where he writes that essay and when he go, you know, decides to go through it. That three weeks of misery, like that, that's one of the bits that got me on this. Um, cause if it's, is it, do you read it that it's in real time? Was you just kind of remembering the key points and kind of jumping forward? Um, because if you're remembering in real time, that that does give us some insight into how long three poops is. <laughs> uh, if you <laughs> repeated it a few times, um, we're never letting that go. Um, nope. <laughs> we can. I guess we we have a number of seconds and we have a number of poops. If only we could put the pieces together. <laughs> <laughs> we just need to get this conversion rate to work for God help me, I am not a smart man. <laughs> the answer is always nineteen. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> One poop every, is nineteen seconds. Every. Uh, <laughs> Every 19 hours. I get that 19 stuff now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, I, uh, I kind of got it in the first couple of episodes. I'm like, oh, 19. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> no, no. Then you, read, then you read book five. You're like, oh, yeah. That's, totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Book 19. I remember this book. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, yeah. No, that's just like replaying of like, hey, and now you died. And now you're in Midworld. And now you died again. And yep. then you died. And you're back in Midworld. And then you died. It's over and over and over. God, that sucks. Yep, that would drive me crazy too. Yep. His um his hope that once the memories went out because he can remember that he died, but his he's reliving the memories as if I think he even says like the person in the memories doesn't know he's going to die yet. Mm-hmm. So l- reliving it knowing that you're going to die and his hope that once he does die in the memory that it would go away and then it doesn't it just starts from the beginning again. Oh my god. Just heartbreaking for like this 11-year-old kid who's <sighs> just trying to go along and get along. <clears throat> yeah. Mm. Uh, that's... And suffering in silence as well. Like he's managing to keep this all relatively to himself as well. Yeah, yeah. Like people around mm-hmm. him can sense that something, you know, something's wrong. But like, mm. you know, for for a kid between the age of ten and um, let's say eighty two, there's always something wrong. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when he's on his walkabout here, um, going out, uh, true, and he he comes across um, a couple of things that are uh, notable. First of which, you know, he's walking around Midtown Manhattan, passes by a lot that is hidden behind, uh, that's under construction and is hidden behind a a fence where everything just kind of feels right. Um, And the voices stop and, you know, they're replaced with kind of this sense that this is, this is the white. This is the coming of the white. 
Um, and what the white is, is never really going to be explored until well after the opposition and what stands against the white, um, you know, is, uh, is introduced, you know. But uh, even as a even as a kid reading this, when you see like it's the it's the white, like it just summoned all of these images of King Arthur and being on the right side of everything and being the hero. Like it, as soon as you say that, like it conjures up all of these things in my head. Yeah. So even without the context for it, it just immediately worked for me. Yeah. I got Gandalf out of that. Like, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The good boys are coming. <laughs> oh, and because we live in a constant melting nightmare world, um, I thought I, I looked at the white and I was like, huh, why does it have to be white? Why does white have to be good? <laughs> oh God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it's uh it's it's one of those things. You uh, try try not to be too 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 woke to enjoy this. Just uh, just roll with it. It, does, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't actually mean anything. The, the opposition, like even there, there, there's not even, so the, the opposition to the white is not the black. It's the, it's the red. So there you yeah. go. It's not a, it's not a racial thing. Um, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> no. Cause Stephen King's really good at those, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Racial things. Stephen <laughs> King's expertise. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I, I do like this little happy corner where uh -huh. there's, there's just some nice people hanging around like, Hey, nice day, kid. He's like, yeah, it is. No. It's, yeah, <laughs> the voices have gone. He's having a genuinely nice time for the first time in about three weeks. Yeah, they're like there are these uh, like executives and uh, executives in suits, and instead of you know practicing the art of the kill, uh, they're playing tic tac toe on the fence. <laughs> yeah, uh, doesn't Jake at some point say like it seems like all of New York has been uh, taken a dose of laughing gas because everybody's mm -hmm. just so happy? <laughs> yep, just everything yep. around this corner feels copacetic. Mm. And then from there, he kind of feels like the pull towards the next place he's going. Almost like a beam. Yeah, I'm on the beam. Thanks um, on the beam, team! <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's it's kind of weird. I need to look at the the etymology for on the beam because I am uh, in the process of re-listening of, uh, re to it on audiobook. Um, just because that's a huge long book and I want to uh, have it reread before I go see the movie in September. Mm -hmm. Um and they include like 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 on the beam is used in that book, um, in at least two at least two places that I've seen so far. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if that like is is not specifically referring to like, hey, the dark tower is supported by these beams, and you want to be on them to get to where you're going to go. I wonder if that is actually like a like a colloquialism that I just have no context for outside of these books. Have you read it before? Yes. Yeah. I don't I don't know what our spoiler policy is, but like this this section we're about to get to is um like it's man it's real it's a lot like it it's real itty yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's real itty yeah. I guess is a is a weird thing to say <laughs> oh that made my toes curl <laughs> real itty <laughs> it's a real itty Ooh. Ew, sorry <laughs> I didn't I didn't mean to do you psychic harm when you, when you stand down with bare feet and you kind of just feel some like the dirt like oh it's itty uh, <laughs> <laughs> So, no matter how much you brush off the sand off your feet, you just can't get it off. You're like, oh, uh, litty in my shoes. No. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the second place that he goes to after the feel good corner is um, a place called the Manhattan Restaurant of the Mind, which is a bookstore uh, that is done up like a deli. Um, and you know, there's a lot of attention to detail paid to like the signs, like uh, you know, today fresh shipped in from Florida, we have like Faulkner fillets or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know um, this feels like a very this era kind of store doesn't it it sounds very hipster on the face of it it really does it's mm -hmm. uh it's it's pretty kitschy um and hipster Welcome is a, to the book and burger <laughs> <laughs> uh hipster is a good word for it because we're also introduced to uh the proprietor of this place who is going to be a very important person in these books uh calvin tower which you know everybody I, I probably should have just um put like some kind of reverb on tower because <laughs> hey you know why not <laughs> just do the law and order intro like calvin da, 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 <laughs> tower <laughs> <laughs> yep <laughs> so i i know when i read this the first time and his name was revealed and i just kind of again just stopped and went really <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but eventually that i mean you, you know this because you've read up through book six that kind of coincidence is just a rigor <laughs> so. yeah this is there's no such thing as coincidence it's all car it's all beam <laughs> yep all the way down i do like <laughs> I, I do like that Jake reacts that way too. The, like that that's really nice because this is his kind of first experience with this cost stuff. And he's like Calvin Tower, he's like, What? Uh -huh. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> he almost does like a full anime on it. I love it. Like, huh? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, uh, Calvin Tower is a, you know, a, a, a heavy set band who is incredibly pedantic and who is kind of obsessed with uh, not just literature, but also like literature editions and things like that. Like he sees books as these physical artifacts to be coveted. And that is going to come up in a big bad way um, over the next, uh, well, not so much in book four, but in book five and six. Um, you know, this is going to be a, re a re reoccurring person along with his buddy, Aaron deep now, um, who is, you know, sitting at the counter and who is also playing chess with Calvin. So like, they're just buddies who hang around at this failing bookstore, you know, uh, cracking wise to the customers. Sounds like a sitcom. <laughs> what do I'd you watch that? <laughs> well, we, I would we... totally watch this. Absolutely. Oh yeah. C C C C Calvin and Aaron. <laughs> yeah there's a, there's a british show called uh black books which is kind of similar it's just it, it's more about just a horrible person that owns a bookshop just a really like smelly dirty dusty rubbish bookshop and just <laughs> terrible things that happen but this just sounds like a nicer version of that yeah i'd watch that show black books was great <laughs> <laughs> yeah no I, I i love a bookstore so i'm kind of jealous of them of them having this cool little kitschy setup <laughs> Yeah. And I've, get yourself a Cole, get yourself a library. Get yourself a spare room. Get yourself a library. I've got one. It's amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I really ought to. Uh, I don't know. Have a room for my books. I'm, I'm I'm looking at houses, and so I would love to have a have a room that is just a, like a study. Yeah. <sighs> get bookcases, and then make sure you can like put one of the bookcases on a slide, so you can maybe hide some sort of bat pole behind it. Like mm -hmm. if you're gonna do it, go mm -hmm. all in. Mm -hmm. Go all in. We've actually. Yes. I was I was in the process of uh, pricing a uh, mechanical rotating bookcase. Uh, to be installed at my office several uh, several years ago, back when Ooh. we had money and when doing such dumb things seemed like a good idea, um, and they are incredibly expensive to install. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> my last boss had a uh, he, he he built this huge enormous mansion in Phoenix in a place called Paradise Valley. So you can imagine like what the what the average house goes for in a place called Paradise Valley. But um, <laughs> he had a he, he built this huge like playroom for his grandkids, and one of the walls was look like a bookcase but you could hit the button and it would slide out and it was actually a hidden room for all the little grandkids like adults could barely even fit in there you had to get on your hands and knees to walk in he, oh yeah he told me how much it cost to build that one day and i was like you were absolutely out of your mind <laughs> put me in your will, <laughs> in your will. <laughs> at, least, at least let me come and crawl inside that room because that seems like it'd be a very fun experience yeah <laughs> so this is where uh, Jake finds the, the two books, right? This is where we finally meet Charlie the Choo Choo? Yes. This is where he gets Charlie the Choo Choo and some kind of riddle book whose title I didn't write down. But it's like riddles and games for boys and girls like you and me throughout time. Um, but yeah, like he is drawn to these two books because he goes to the children's section. And, you know, uh, Calvin, <laughs> Calvin properly asserts, like, why are you buying this? Jake says, "Oh, it's for my for my little brother. It's his birthday." And I was like, "No, you're 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 an only child if I've ever seen one." <laughs> Owned. Yeah, Calvin has a bullshit detector, man. <laughs> right? <laughs> he really does. And he goes into this whole thing like he he properly clocks the entire situation. Like, ah, uh, you're on French leave from whatever you know a lack of day school that you're in, you know, this academy, something or other. Like, he, he he's got it. He's got it on lock. And Jake's like, yeah, yeah, you got me. Whatever. Let me let me have this. But like. Uh, Calvin takes a real shine to Jake. You know, he hears his name and says, "Oh, you're a you know like that's like a like a like a Western cowboy kind of name." And you're Jake Chambers. That you know sounds like one of the heroes who rides off into the sunset, like Wayne D. Overholzer. <laughs> like the section. Yeah, yeah. And, and Jake is like, I'm not really sure if I like this dude or not. <laughs> 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 like this dude is maybe Calvin he's a little intense maybe for an 11 year old. <laughs> maybe he's the fake psychic. Maybe he's been looking at Jake's Facebook page, going, Ah, Ooh. I know what he's into. Mm. Ooh, he goes to this school. Oh, when he bowls a 158, I can tell him that later. <laughs> Cole, can you uh, can you hire me as a social media manager so that I can create fake Facebook pages for Jake Chambers from the 1970s? <laughs> to promote Radio Free um, World? I, I, I will assist you, and we can do it for free. <laughs> okay, yeah, that sounds good too. When I say hire, I just mean like you know, hand me beer every once in a while while we're, while we're making fake Facebook statuses. Oh, of course, yeah. hold another great game. Love you guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Average is 160 now. Very good for 11. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah he's got these two books uh one of which uh, is charlie the choo-choo written by a woman named beryl evans uh that is going to uh be important later on so remember that name 
um, and also this uh, the, the, this riddle book, both of which are going to pan out because they are um, portents of things to come later on um, in this book and very early on in book number four. That isn't a spoiler. Again, that is the policy on the show. If it's important, we're going to let you know so you can remember it. Um, but um, the riddle book doesn't have any answers in the back. And so uh, he takes it back in and says, hey, you know, he's got this uh, like Samson's riddle. Uh, what what is meat at the front and sweet at the back or something like that? I forget what it is. Um, yeah. <laughs> meat in the front, sweet in the back. <laughs> it's Samson's haircut. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, you know, as as he leaves with this, uh, we'll, we'll talk about um, we'll talk about Charlie the Choo Choo later because it's actually a bigger section but what's important to know now is that uh, jake does not trust the illustration on the front of this like it immediately inspires you know a certain amount of contempt in him mm-hmm. yeah yep. um but he walks away and says like yeah no i'm never going to come back to the store just he has you know certainty just like he knows he's never going to go back to piper um and as he's leaving he actually passes um back by that uh that lot and he gets well, he, it. It, he, he gets a feeling, doesn't he, as he gets out of the door. Mm-hmm. And he mm-hmm. runs. He just, like, Tom Cruise goes for it. Like, he, <laughs> he jukes around a, a pram and he jumps over some boxes. Like, yep. go on, my son. <laughs> <laughs> Is Tom Cruise the fastest guy you know, Fatty? Is that... <laughs> he just runs so much. Yeah. He's just always running. Every film, just this tiny little... Little, little, tiny, little frog leg run that he does. Like, His tiny little I do my own stunts run. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, fair play to that. He's insane, but you know, oh, he of jumps course, off yeah. stuff in films. I mean, fair play. <laughs> yep. No, no. He, he deserves credit. He, he he definitely does. No, like he like he gets this. Like he has that uh, kind of like a like a, a, a heightened. I was about to say a, a, a heightened sense of sense, but like everything becomes more vivid. Everything becomes, um, you know, it, it pops, and he has these premonitions again. Like he he thinks, okay, well, I'm going to pass by. Uh, a record store and i'm gonna hear uh this rolling you know the rolling stone song paint it black um and i'm going to you know see this the, the, this kind of people it's like a like a, a mirror version of foreseeing his own death but instead it is him coming back by this lot uh when the secret that is inside of it chooses to reveal itself to him uh also the uh, the record store is called tower of power records which is weird because that is totally the name of a band so I don't know. Um, and, and Jake thinks to Does himself, any... oh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, J- J- Jake thinks to himself like, oh, I guess towers are selling cheap today. <laughs> the the phrase tower of power has been ruined for me by Frank Zappa. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with that song, but no, no. Okay. Well, then I won't, I won't go into it, but it's, it's is, is it's... it a dick? If it's Frank Zappa, it's probably a dick, right? Um, he can spend about an hour on the tower of power as long as he gets a golden shower. Like okay. one of those. Yep. yep. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. So now so, like so, all so, towers of power have been ruined for me henceforth. Yep. Is, that <laughs> like, a, I'm just done. is that a Frank's hey. garage one? I, yeah. So, so it sounds like no, something from Frank's garage. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd have to, I mean, my, my, my memory on Frank Zappa's <laughs> album names are rusty. So I'd have to go look it up. If you want it for the show notes, though, I can try to find it for you. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can do I can do a search for it. But uh, but yeah, it's definitely. Uh, yep, that's a the, 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 that's that's a phrase for a dick, isn't it? Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. but, but so what, what's your favorite euphemism for penis? Mine is leaning tower to please her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that also applies, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I came up with that myself when I was 17, and it's it's probably my proudest achievement. (laughs) Oh, that's a Patty original? (laughs) That's mine. Oh, Oh, man. That is great. (laughs) Let's get that out there. Like, do I need to buy ad space uh, to to, to get people to, uh, like, to start using that? Shit, someone's already registered it. Damn. (laughs) (laughs) Registered it in the dick joke compendium. Yeah. (laughs) So... um, Jake is running because he thinks he's going to find another door, the door to end all doors at this, you know, lot in the feel good area that he saw before. Um, But when he gets there, he realizes, no, there is no building here. It's actually been taken down. You know, it's been it's been demolished. Right. Um, And he Mm -hmm. sees, you know, a a sign on the fence that uh, this the site, you know, this magical feel good place is being worked on by a company called the Sombra Real Estate um, company and is being turned into the turtle bay luxury condominiums 
Um, and the sign is old, indicating that the project is way behind schedule and is tagged uh, with, uh, you know, with the name Bango Skank, uh, who is, you know, make, make a note of that because Bango Skank is going to pop up in graffiti later on as well. Um, <laughs> and along with this, you know, again, we have this turtle imagery, which Jeremy uh, made a reference to the, you know, the, the, the movie it, or the, the book It. Yes, this is related to that. So you should know. Um, with a, with a poem saying, see the turtle of enormous girth on a shell. He holds the earth. If you want to run and play, come along the beam today, which is, you know, an echo of a poem that we heard earlier in the first chapter, uh, which was Roland relating a nursery rhyme from his childhood about learning the guardians of the beam, right? The turtle is the one who stands opposite the bear. Yeah. And this, the, the idea that Jake and, the rest of the quartet are on opposite sides of the tower from one another was really, really compelling to me as a kid. Like picturing this, the way that Roland drew it in the sand in the chapter before this with the the kind of oh. looks like a wagon wheel, basically, with the circle with all the spokes with the tower in the middle. And then picturing Jake on one side and, you know, modern day in New York or not modern day New York, but New York. And then <laughs> all of our quartet and midworld on the other side and how they're going to try to get together. Was I was I was just I was insanely curious. I was like, how, what is going to happen? How are they going to do this? And mm -hmm. yeah, I. I really like the idea. Like I, I would, I would really love to see. I look like at when they find these these kind of guardian stuff around Midworld because there's not mm -hmm. a lot of it, and I wanted to hear even more of it. Yeah, you you actually just introduced a new idea. I never stopped to consider that Jake's reality here with the Rose, which is going going to be pretty important. You know, we're we're, we're going to talk about that. Um, I, I never considered that that would be on the opposite side. That it would be you know closer to the turtle. I thought that mm. just that the turtle held an outsized, an outsized role in the pantheon because you know, mostly because of it, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, um, but that is that is that actually kind of holds. I never put that together. That's a good insight, Jeremy. Well I've got, I've got, a, I've got all that kinds was patronizing, of wasn't it? <laughs> no, I, just, I, I, don't, I don't know what to say about it because I haven't, I haven't thought about it more. I need to, well I, need, I need to go and let it <laughs> roll around. I need to pull out my, uh, my, my dark tower. Uh, what is it? The concordances and look up Maturin and see, uh, and, and see if he, yeah. uh, if he holds domain over, uh, over Jake's win. Um, <laughs> You don't have the uh, Design Works Wastelands edition so that has the stuff in the back with the appendix divided out by the. No, okay, never mind. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't have the Design Works chapter. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a yeah. Future, future Press did a strategy a strategy guide for the series. It was weird. Uh, <laughs> no, this compendium, like those uh, those concordances, are good. I I use those for reference a lot, actually. Um, and, and I need to look at those. Like, are they still available? I, I I've never ever even picked one up at a store for some reason. I don't I don't know why, and I, I don't own them, which seems really weird for me. I'm positive that you would be able to find uh, like a used copy of them for like twelve bucks or something. Like I oh, okay. I got I got both of them at Powell's Books when I was in Portland for like for like eight dollars a piece. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, uh, they're good. Like they're 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 really dry. Like everything is just uh, like an index of different character and concept names. But uh, but it like cool. it gives references for like what books you know, what books the uh, the different people show up in and stuff, yeah. Um, but uh, so Jake sees this, and again, all of this is associated with this feel good uh, kind of kind of zone that, that he's in, and he climbs into the lot and actually takes a really rough fall, um, so rough that later on he believes that everything he sees after this is a hallucination because he you know bumped his <laughs> noggin so hard that you know he started seeing stuff. But um, when he's in the vacant lot, you know, he notices that the building that used to be here was Tom and Jerry's Artistic Deli, uh, which we have seen before. Um, party platters are their specialty. <laughs> Again, that is entered into these weird little refrains that pop up throughout the entire book. Party platters are specialty. <laughs> can you, re yeah, can you remind weird. me where we've seen Tom and Jerry's Artistic Deli? I, I, I don't remember this at all. It, it was, was it, it Eddie. Yeah, it was Eddie. Um, Eddie talked about um, talked about passing by it. Uh, when he was a kid. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Mm, thank yeah, you. it was it was it was earlier in this book. It wasn't uh, it wasn't before this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank th thank you, Patty. I <laughs> I was struggling for that. I, I just I, read that bit earlier. I was like, ah! <laughs> yeah. I just I remember mentioning it last episode, and like that that takes precedence. Um, mm -hmm. weirdly. 
uh, because of the order of operations. Um, but, uh, you know, in here, Jake's senses are heightened again, and he can hear voices singing. Everything is kind of glowing. You know, he even talks about like, the litter scattered about having this, you know, just uh, the, the, this light to it. Um, and in the center of this lot, he can see this tangle of weeds and these kind of like briar briar patches and stuff. And um, this is full of faces that are all singing and kind of speaking to him in this chattering voice. And inside, he can see two things. Um, he can see a key, uh, which is closer to him. And beyond that, he can see the rose. So, like, this is incredibly important and will remain important for the rest of the series. Because Jake um, has kind of found something that is part of the linchpin, right? And he gets he, he found he, that absolutely. point, and like the the mm -hmm. the, the sounds, I, I like the the description of his senses being heightened, having all these voices that were sort of saying, you know, the whiteness and love and life and yes, um, <laughs> they're all saying yes. But I read that as hearing uh, the band yes <laughs> initially. I so mean, like to be fair, turn the JoJo off, like, Patty. Turn it off. <laughs> 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 Um, and then you just hear roundabout coming out from this empty lot. Like I'd go in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Things can happen there later. <laughs> I need to decide which is better: the owner of a lonely heart or the owner of a broken heart. Tell me, yes. <laughs> Tell me, Rose. Tell me. <laughs> Nicely done. Nicely done. <laughs> this but whole yeah. scene reminded me of uh, like, have you ever been in a like a driving right? before a thunderstorm and like the crowd the sky is just covered in like black and gray clouds but the trees underneath are like this hugely bright green that just kind of stick out because yeah, it hasn't started like, raining yet the, the the air itself is green and in fact i'm in the middle of that right now because i'm looking out it's been raining all day um and i record in front of a window and the air is green because there is a thunderstorm coming uh as we speak yeah, yeah it, it, this is this is what i always think of when i when i read this scene because just picturing just how how bright and real everything is just like it's something about a dark sky and bright colors it just really works yeah vivid and popping yeah yeah like when you go to the dlc area in the witcher 3 and everything's really 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 <laughs> bright green compared to the muddy greens everything else is like wow this is beautiful it's like being in a painting no oh, man i can't wait to play that so good cole yeah no no don't don't worry it'll happen because oh, Geralt is basically roland Yep, <laughs> it's true. Oh, it's true so from the from the first portion that I played. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> isn't there a uh, isn't there a Martin at some point in Witcher Three? I think I've, I think I remember seeing a Martin. Like there's there's a direct Dark Tower reference in the Witcher Three too, there's, right? Uh, Gauntero Dim. That's mm. what it is. That's what it is. Yeah, okay. and cool. he's sitting at the table in the first room in the very first half an hour of the video game. Oh wow! Yep, mm -hmm. um, that's why I and remember I, it because Laura, I Laura's it playing it. My wife's playing it at the moment, and him, I, I, I like he's like that's him. <laughs> that's, he's right. what the fuck that's that's really funny i i was losing my mind i'm uh, <laughs> everything's god 19 yeah you get um, whack god 19 as fuck <laughs> <laughs> i'm surprised i didn't notice that actually because that, that that is probably the only portion of that game that i played i didn't notice ever. it at first because he plays a big big role in the first dlc pack Mm. And you go like, oh hang on and it, it's, it's him you know it's the character it's not been added in he was always there like oh, yeah, yeah huh yeah so everything is heightened and he sees this um so he notices the key and this uh mirrors the one that eddie saw in the fire in the previous chapter um and he turns to the rose which is in this bed of uh purple alien grass um and it blooms it actually opens up into this singing inferno when he looks in he can see that you know it is not just like pollen it's not just the you know the interior parts of the rose it's actually a sun that is contained within the very inside of this and inside you know, the the song of this rose that is, you know, singing to him, you know, singing his name and kind of welcoming welcoming him into its into its warmth, he hears this note of discord and he has this vision of this worm that is coming to kind of strangle and consume the rose. Like this is a force for pure good that is very much un under threat, and his overwhelming need is to protect it. Right? Like the, like that that is the that is the takeaway from this. Not only that he has this mysterious key that when he holds it, uh, his, uh, you know, voices go away. Uh, but, you know, like this is something that is vulnerable that could be plucked, that could be, you know, plowed over, and it will have drastic consequences for the entire world. This is so much better than the um, ending scene that we get at the Gunslinger in the first book, where the Blade of Grass expanding into the universes. And I think shows 
how much Stephen King has matured as a writer between these two books mm-hmm. that this this just feels like the center of the universe versus some crazy space ass adventure that the, the, the gunslinger <laughs> went on uh, this this feels important in a way that that doesn't almost if that makes sense like this feels it's just so powerful and like the singing coming up and then all of a sudden, like you said, the worm and feeling a sickness in it, like mm-hmm. that, it made me concerned about this rose and I'm sitting you know, in my bedroom with a book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the strength of King's writing in this section. Yeah. Um, and even if you, you know, so, so it's impossible to strip away that like, yes, he's writing this over the course of decades. So he has gotten better. Like what Roland saw before was Martin's kind of skewed version of the events of actually showing him the truth. Whereas what Jake is actually seeing here, you know, years and years later with King's added ability is the real goodness, the real thing that is at the heart of it. The so, rose is the truth. Yep, <laughs> exactly. And so he can, he Blaine can, is the truth. <laughs> <laughs> that a chick, that a she don't not to worry. You've got the key. Yeah. <laughs> so it can work both ways. You can, you can incorporate his adolescence in book one, um, into why this thing in book three, 15 years later, stacks up so much better. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> it, it, when I finished reading it, I didn't sit there and go, huh? Like I did when oh, I read the yeah. last bit of the gun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there is that. Yeah. It, it, it did. I got it. it. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, this didn't feel like a very, uh, a very obvious uh, kind of attempt to establish the mechanics of this world. But it really yeah. does have bigger implications than what Martin even showed us. Yeah. Um, so he comes to and, you know, he notices like, oh, my head is bleeding. And he looks at a rock and there's blood on it. Oh, when I fell in here, I think that I probably hit my head and hallucinated all of that. But he really, you know, he thinks, no, that's not actually true. As he looks around and realizes the grass is purple because of the paint. He really he, he, he realizes that, be, you know, this... This ordinary look, this non-magical kind of sense to things is camouflage, right? This is how the rose mm. protects itself from people coming in and messing with it is to, you know, just look as ordinary as possible. And as if to confirm this, he looks back at the rose and he sees Allie's face, Allie being the uh, the barkeep from book one that Roland slept with, you know, like he recognizes her right away and even speaks to her and she responds like, it confirms like it's almost like a the the, the rose is winking at him it's it's really weird that it's Allie's face right because he has <laughs> no particular connection besides you know the gunslinger telling him about you know murdering all the people in this small town <laughs> but uh it's not like he I'm saw ally it's so glad anything, you say but... that because i wasn't sure i was like did he actually meet her i don't want to read it all again no, no, and, and I, I may be wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure, like, because I remember Roland, um, like, kind of confessing his sins to Jake on the on the way through the mountain because he was he knew that he was probably going to have to sacrifice him, so he was kind of nervous and apologetic about it. But Jake wasn't. It was long after the the village, or I can't remember the name of the stupid town, but that alley uh, was toll. in. That um, toll. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> how, how can I forget toll? Uh, <laughs> So it, it, did this strike you as weird, Cole? Like, I, I don't know why Allie is here, and I don't really think she's a super important character as, as far as things go, as, other than to be used as kind of a prop to scare Roland more often than not. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, so this would be a relatively, not small, but like, you know, minor detail um, in a story that Roland told to Jake. Um, and the fact mm-hmm. that he that he sees her hair, that, that he sees her there connects what he's experiencing with Roland and his time in, you know, in Roland's world, you know, like it actually like confirms like, yes, all of this is related. If it was something huge, it could be a product of his own mind, but it is this relatively small thing. It's like a canary trap. It's like the, uh, the, 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 the small little fake town they put on a, they put on a globe to copyright it because that town doesn't actually exist. Mm, okay. Yeah. You know, I could be making excuses like for that for that weird poll. It no, no, I'm into it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe because she's got. Like, I don't even. A, is she like a scar on her yes. face or something? Is it like he maybe yeah. recognized mm-hmm. her? Like, oh, that's her. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And and also show, like, show him Roland. <laughs> she, she 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 is a notable person who is who <laughs> is uh, uh, visually identifiable. Um, who Jake would have only heard about uh, from this man who up to this point he could he could only have assumed was fiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. So I, I I can see that that doesn't keep it from feeling weird and feeling like a like a minor thing. I'm doing some mm-hmm. some level of gymnastics uh, to, to 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 square that circle. 
this is one of those reasons why I'll never get the opportunity to interview my heroes because like I would ask the dumbest questions like, like <laughs> I, I, an opportunity to have dinner with Stephen King. I'd be like, so book three, the dark tower, Ali space. What's up with that? And, like, <laughs> and I would probably ask like Hideo Miyazaki about patch notes for dark souls one. Like, what, so what was the reason that you nerfed the butterfly shield anyway? What's going on with that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would ask him about that too because like that was a huge reason to go and beat that boss it's optional come on yeah <sighs> let's talk about the meta for a moment <laughs> <laughs> this, this meta that hasn't existed for five and a half years yep <laughs> oh god <laughs> so after when, when jake's finished he says a really good line when he finishes and he sort of leaves a lot he just stood there and says to himself what a day Boy, <laughs> Boy <laughs> myself I... out loud. Boy, am I tuckered out. <laughs> you had a big day, me. <laughs> you had a big day. <gasps> yeah. And so he decides to go back home, where his parents are just completely angry with him. Uh, presumably, the the school had called and said, and said, hey, uh, your kid ran away. Um, and also, he shows up covered in blood. Um, I think his mom is more concerned about his clothes than she is about him. Um, yeah, I, that as well. <laughs> yeah, and his dad is definitely, you know, mortified that his son would embarrass him so by going true and from the Piper, the Piper School of all places. Uh, and Jake is not having any of it. Like this is a real fuck yeah, Jake kind of moment. Just it, just building up this tension with his dad and kind of in the overbearing shadow in Jake's mind, and then you know he reaches out to grab Jake's arm, like you little shit, you're gonna tell me where you've been, and Jake just. His eyes literally start flaming. Like he's, he sees a literal fire in his son's eye. Yeah. And it's like, you're not going to touch me ever like that again. <laughs> it's just like, even now at 36 years old, I'm like, fuck yeah, Jake, tell him. <laughs> like I can't, it, I can't help just but get excited. He pulls his dad's hand off as well. And just like gives him the gunslinger. I was like, no, you don't. <laughs> Go on, my son. Yep. He pretty, just he, he straight up fights back. You know, he, he is, he is bucking from under the authority is taking it. He's taking it on himself, which like, it's a little bit disappointing when later on he turns around and makes an excuse. Like, you know, he decides to hide behind the fact that he was stressed out about, about exams. Like, I, I kind of wish that like he could have left owning it as opposed to just disappearing, you know, without, without a trace. Well, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I, the way I saw that is that he wanted the, the parents just to leave him alone because he's, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's like, well, what happened to you today? Well, I found a magic rose, and there was this bookshop. <laughs> I think I hit my head. Mom, have I told you I'm dead? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, um, exam fever, leave me alone now. Yeah, but but like, but like, they're, they're not even brave enough. Like, his parents aren't even brave enough to go up and talk to them, talk to them themselves. They send up Miss Shaw with bologna sandwiches. <laughs> to, you know, to ply him and to get like information and you know like he wor he works with her as a proxy saying like yeah i've been incredibly stressed about exams um and the thing is um the entire the the the, the, the entire staff has kind of figured this out too and this is where we get these notes that are uh in turns you know the first the, the the first is incredibly affecting like i read this and i was like oh god oh no please no um mm. and, the, <laughs> and the second one is fucking hilarious so the first is from his french teacher saying hey you know i i heard you ran out um here are your test results you know or just like just saying like hey if you're worried about your french exam uh, we can work with you. We can get you an extension. Like we just want you to succeed. All of us care about you. We, you know, we 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 like you plenty. I was like, oh, oh no, oh oh bo oh boy, oh man, <laughs> oh god, human compassion. Is this what it feels like? Oh Christ. <laughs> Which, like, like uh, you know, uh, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but I'm a person of some anxiety, um, and that has been the case for pretty much my entire life, um, going back into school, school times. And so, like, there have been times where somebody has, like, said, like, hey, you're worrying about this way too much. Like, if you need something, let us know. And, like, it's really made a huge difference. So to, so to see Jake, mm. who has worried so much and has kind of suffered alone and kind of accepted that, like, hey, my schoolwork is going to suffer and I'm just going to have to, like, you know, let that happen because nobody's going to help me um, to see that come around as, wait, no, like they, they care about you. They see it. They know they know more than you would ever let on um, or more than they would ever let on. Um, and they, they're going to make it better for you is actually like really tender in a way that I just wouldn't expect from this. Yeah, I mean, it, you guys this, were talking like, about, so this um... is a weird confessional one, isn't it? Because. Like I actually, mm -hmm. I actually had this 
oh, yeah? uh, teacher when I was when I was 15. I was having a really like rough time with exams and stuff, and I was just I was losing it a bit. Um, and it's one of the teachers. They 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 took me aside and they said, "Do you need to talk?" I was like, "Yeah, maybe I do." <laughs> and it was really like nice just that someone cared. Yeah. Like, oh man, you know. And like, not to say that my 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 dad's a cokehead and. No, no, no. But, no, my parents are great. Um, but it was nice to see someone like outside the sphere, like an adult, like give a shit. Yeah. You know, and I read this like, yeah, man, this is good. This it feels, it felt genuinely really, really nice. And mm-hmm. yeah, this is like confession time with, with Paddy and Cole. <laughs> yeah. uh, it makes a it makes a huge difference. Yeah. I'll get my poetry book. I'll, I'll, you'll love it. Hang on. Yeah. <laughs> Oh God! Let's. I mean, I've got one. Like, if you want to do it? We can do it. But you, I promise you, you don't want to read my read my poetry. It's, I, it's very terrible for that era. I am I am sitting next to totes and totes and totes of old school papers right now. Oh wow. God! <laughs> like I, I'm going through them slowly because most of it's garbage. It's like Spanish notes or whatever. But like I'm looking for things that I would feel really sad if I threw away. But I'm mostly just finding like, no, that that doodle is embarrassing. That fight club. That fight club. <laughs> quote in the margin is a little bit uh, uh untoward <laughs> i was not 20 yet it was not shameful <laughs> <laughs> you have to appreciate the work in its original form and we have to know that the world has moved on since then but you have to appreciate it for the time that it happened <laughs> yep <laughs> how many of the uh of the fancy s's did you did you draw in, your, in the margins of your binder cole because i found oh. like five of those the other oh, those, day. Those, <laughs> those, ridiculous. those stussy s's or whatever they were um yeah yeah the yeah. diamondy ones yeah yeah, yeah uh not, not 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 so many that wasn't so much my jam um i mm-hmm. was more uh i was i was more the kind of person to draw like let's say the queens of the stone age logo that is the q with the sperm as the uh as the cross dash on it oh god i'm so old <laughs> <laughs> I sorry man. That podcast with babies <laughs> 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 Sorry, man. I, was... I remember all the bands that made up Queens of the Stone Age before they were Queens of the Stone Age, man. Yeah, yep. No, I eventually got oh, got, got, got into Caius. Good, go ahead. What do you think about the new Ben 10, man? I really like it. <laughs> oh, Yo Gabba Gabba. Yeah, I drew all those characters all over my shit. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I was I was 15 when, uh, when Songs for the Deaf came out. It was very formative for me. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Uh, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> You guys were talking about uh, talking last episode about uh, Stephen King's kind of issue with, or no, this wasn't last episode. This was on the Rose Matter episode about his issues with like cops and trying to think of like, was there ever been a good cop in uh, a Stephen King novel? I was thinking about that a lot when I was reading this section because has there ever been a good dad? And it seems like no is the answer in a Stephen King novel. But uh, uh, also, it's it seems like teachers are always his go to for uh, really great authority authority figures for for kids and for like the the kids or teenagers that he's writing about like i remember yeah. that with it I, i'm i'm vaguely remembered something like that with the stand although i can't put my finger on it now i think it was something with the uh with the moon guy but i might be wrong no um, um there, there was a good dad in the stand franny's dad was really was really good um he you, did yeah, oh yeah <laughs> he was he, he was uh played played by doc hayward in the uh in the miniseries yeah yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i can't remember uh a good no it was uh it was glenn glenn, glenn was the uh was like the the professor in uh in, oh, in the see, stand. yeah yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah which makes sense like you know stephen king is somebody who you know is, is you know admittedly like shaped and formed by his experiences with like writing professors and stuff for him to look to academia for like positive for positive authority figures that makes that you know that's that's square yeah, I just like the I like the overlap between that and the what you guys were talking about in the Rose Matter episode. Yeah, and people came out and like mentioned a couple of couple of good cops um, from uh, from Stephen King's works, um, but oh, uh, cool. I I did not make a note of them, so I cannot recall. So they do not exist as <laughs> yep. far as this conversation is concerned. <laughs> but I want people to know that I did get their emails. <laughs> uh, so that's the first e- uh, I said email. That's the first message he gets um, expressing concern. Mm-hmm. The second one, uh, which is completely <laughs> unexpected for Jake, um, is a, a message from his English teacher, which you know also says like, "Hey, you know the French teacher probably uh, you know said." the things I want to say better, but I want to tell you how great this essay was. Um, in fact, the, uh, the English pr- 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 professor praises it as stunningly original. 
<laughs> well, I mean, yeah, yeah, it is that. <laughs> it's, it, it, it is stunning, and I don't know that there is anything else done like it. Um, <laughs> Jake is reading this, and he can't stop laughing. Um, but like, she's coming out and saying, "Oh, the symbolism! I can't even pretend to understand who the gunslinger is. Maybe it's your dad." I noticed his name's Roland. I went, I even went to your to your file and saw that you, you know your your own dad was named Elmer, but his middle initial is R. And just like like reading way too much into it, this feels so much like Stephen King. Um, like digging into academic literary criticism a little bit, mm-hmm. where something mm-hmm. that you know, doesn't mean anything, you know, in the content, you know, for, for anything that this, uh, that this professor knows, um, is, <laughs> is, is praised for being genius, even, even though it is complete nonsense. It's, it's the idea of like doing like, just, just taking a canvas and just sort of throwing some paint at it. Yeah. Maybe stapling, uh, an old bus ticket to it, sticking it in an art gallery and watching everyone go, Oh God, it means so much. <laughs> <laughs> I I literally peed on that. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I didn't even look of, when I did I, it. I yeah. don't understand it, but I it's the best student work that I've read in years. Like the combination <laughs> of those two things. Like no, I mean you kind of maybe need to understand the eleven year old's writing if you're going to give it a good grade. Like come yeah. on, <laughs> <laughs> you kind of need to understand what he's saying before you say, "Hey, I want to publish this in the literary magazine." <laughs> <laughs> and this obviously cracks Jacob too, right? Like he's just he is just dying with laughter in a way that like I probably haven't laughed as hard as Jake is doing like right now in, in years. Like it's just he For is like just double over in pain. Yeah, yeah. He's worried he's going to have a heart attack or a stroke because of how much he's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> but like you know, so it's so it's a combination, a combination of how uh, of how ridiculous. Uh, this uh, you know the, the, this whole thing is, and also relief. Like he gets an A plus out of this, so like he you know he left this behind you know in his semi fugue state, thinking, oh my gosh, they're going to commit me because of what I have written here. But instead, he is lauded as genius. That doesn't change anything about what he's going through, right? It doesn't change you know his increasing detachment from the world around him. Um, instead, all it does is just kind of like <laughs> this thing that I was worried about, you know, both of these things that I was worried about that people were going to either come down hard on me or send me away for these crazy things that I did, um, are not going to come, c- come true. The, you know, it kind of confirms that the only danger is in his head. Mm. Turns out he's actually brilliant. Like gunslingers are at everything. Oh yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> just, yeah. I'm just brilliant without even trying. I'm, I'm just good yep. at everything. I am a competence elemental. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and also i have fire eyes and i can shoot guns real real good oh yeah <laughs> so Don't get my bad side i'll look at you with my eyes <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's take this into the home stretch um because you know jake deciding that the heat is off and you know that the uh, the voices have died down because of uh, because of his exposure to the rose decides to open up this creepy creepy children's book that he has you know uh taken from the store uh which is called charlie the choo choo which exists you can buy this strangely enough it was actually published uh in 2016 seems like a long time for that to it's it's and it's absolutely great like the the illustrations of blaine the mono in this are so fantastic or charlie the choo choo excuse me we'll get to we'll get to play <laughs> yeah. in a minute but um like it's <laughs> <laughs> spoilers um it's just it's very like it's very creepy it's very like you look at it and uh, th- th- there's a caption on the very front that says if i were to ever write a children's book it would be just like this from stephen king and i'm like yep that's exactly because <laughs> it's it's perfectly innocent sounding throughout the whole thing but it's just the illustrations that bring it from like it's just you know just a normal children's book to Oh my God! You're going to kill all those children. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh gosh, and the yeah, the, the the illustrations cannot be uh, cannot be oversold because Jake hones in on how untrustworthy the face on this uh, on this train is. You know, like looking at his smug, complacent smile 
um you know with the with all the teeth <laughs> with, with all teeth bared and then also looking at the uh kind of crazed face of the uh of the of the conductor like i'm literally i just i love this i feel like i'm holding an artifact from that world except for the fact that stephen king has his name on the front of it <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's better than i imagined because jeremy showed me a few of the pictures before we get on tonight um uh-huh. so I've, I've not seen of this you know i've not seen it like in my head when it explained the cover you know it was this this train that was smiling but it wasn't a good smile like mm-hmm. i just pictured like thomas the take the thomas the tank doing like a creep smile uh-huh like a sort of like a mm, mm, sort of like sort a, of like, noise. A, like a sideways smile yeah oh hello <laughs> um <laughs> <ugh>. <laughs> but the, the pictures on the cover are so much more terrifying than i imagined oh yeah I don't like it. <laughs> Do not like it. It fills me with a great sense of unease, and I don't <laughs> want the train to look at me anymore. And I think that they've done a great job with that. Yeah. Um, an- another detail that they've captured on it um, that is related in Jake's kind of observations about this is all the children who are riding in the cars behind the train. Um, it, you know, we are meant to believe that they are screaming in, um, you know, joy, like, oh, my gosh, we're riding this train. It's great. But no, if you look at it out of context, it looks like they are all uh, just as miserable as possible and are fearing for their lives. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. they are scared. <laughs> Yeah, I would definitely recommend people go and grab this because, like, it is incredibly cheap and it is the closest that you're going to get to a relic from the Dark Tower world. Um, And speaking of relics from the Dark Tower world, this has some stuff in it from the Dark Tower world because uh, the main character of this, aside from Charlie the Choo Choo, is Bob, who's an engineer for the Midworld Railway Company. Um, Uh er? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, uh, who is uh, running from the... uh, St. Louis to the Topeka line. And his uh, his engine is a talking choo-choo train called Charlie, who has this one little song, this one little rhyme that he does called Don't Ask Me Silly que- Silly Questions, I Won't Play Silly Games, you know, which hint for later, you know. That's brilliant. <laughs> I didn't get that until later. That is yeah. brilliant. <laughs> the uh, the audiobook version of this, because Frank Muller kind of puts a puts a little bit of uh like 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 a train affect on this, which doesn't make sense. But like, don't ask me silly questions. I won't play silly games. I want to run all day and day and like like it, it, it like it actually has like this uh really deep kind of uh you know locomotive kind of feel to it. Um, That's but, what trains sound like. Yeah, that. Yeah, woo woo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um you know but like at this point like as he's as he as he's reading this you know the setup like saying like i'm pretty sure blaine is dangerous and that and that is the truth like he recalls that line that he wrote even though blaine is nowhere nowhere represented in this so like the the dramatic arc, arc of this book is really really kind of nothing like you know bob refuses to switch away from charlie who is a living breathing creature to go to this uh you know diesel engine no matter how fast and how futuristic it is and so he decides to go and you know wipe down engines in the train graveyard with Charlie until, you know, somebody needs to make one last run to, 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 uh, to Topeka, um, to go see a piano recital by somebody named Susanna where Bob, you know, gets Charlie out where, you know, kind of like brings him back from the, uh, from the brink of death and then makes the run to Topeka delights all the children. And then finally they both retire to, uh, turn Charlie into a, uh, like an amusement park, uh, amusement park ride, which is what we see at the very, you know, like on the, uh, on, on the uh, cover of this book is all these kids riding him around like it's a uh, you know it's a it's a it's a kids kids attraction right and just a quick note that um the president of the company and Susanna's dad is uh like a guy named Mr. Martin so just oh, a, shit, yeah yep <laughs> <laughs> just a just to really drive the point home that this book is definitely connected to oh, the of course world in, in a lot of different ways <laughs> yep <laughs> So yeah, like like it, it is the story about a about a train that can talk, you know, who who is who is on the brink of death, who has this one this one last ride, who has no tolerance for silly questions or games. And just just kind of wants to be what it is. Uh make a note of that, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Write that exact sentence if- down. <laughs> And if you're reading this in real time, wait about ten years between <laughs> before you make a note of it and when it actually is going to be relevant. <laughs> yeah, um, it's it, it's super weird because and we like like I've alluded to this, but um, between book three and book four, we've got um, the mist because we need to cover we need to cover uh, some topics that are in there. We have the stand. Um, then we also have the uh, the Dark Tower movie 
that is coming out around there. And we also have the it movie. Um, so like, we're going to have a, a substantial break between book three and book four. And like, I'm kind of, I'm kind of leaning into that by putting that yeah. incidental stuff in there because I want to emulate how much time was put in between those. Can we do like a um, abject suffering episode of Ready for Midworld where we cover the stand mini series right after we do the book? <laughs> and just see how long we can we can get until we just abandon it. <laughs> see, see how much we. Yeah, I, I don't know. So I, I have mixed feelings about the stand the the, the stand mini series because um um oh gosh what's his name the the actor who plays the guy uh, from Lo- Wings. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right about the guy from Wings. No, uh, uh, Lloyd Henry. The, uh, mm-hmm. um, the, 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 that actor whose name I cannot remember, he played, uh, Albert in, uh, in, 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 in Twin Peaks was actually really inspired casting. There's so many good casting decisions in that, that I don't know how they went so wrong. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, and, and, and just to put it out there, Autumn loves it. She, she absolutely loves it. She makes me watch it like every once in a while. Like it's ridiculous. So I, I, <laughs> I think it'd be, it, I think it'd be interesting to talk about. I don't know that you'd want to cover like the whole thing on like, You'd, you'd want to spend four hours on it, but I, I think it might actually be worth talking about. Well, so so no matter what, like it it, it, it doesn't really matter. So so that actor's name is Miguel Ferrer, um, fantastic actor. Rest in peace. Um, like if we're talking about the uh, the, the the book, we're going to talk about that mini series because like c- kind of like it, that was m- a lot of people's first and only exposure to that story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a little bit. I had time. no idea Miguel Ferrer died. Wow, that's yeah, really no. sad. He died I, must, after... I must have missed it in the um. <clears throat> oh, January seventeenth, January nineteenth. So yeah, I was really depressed for other reasons. Okay, cool, cool, yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he uh, he he definitely passed away. Um, which is which is sad because he's been in so much so much good stuff. Um, blah. I didn't mean to end us on a bummer like that. <laughs> Do we have any final thoughts on uh, on on Charlie the Choo Choo as a work before we before we end the uh, the chapter here? Terrifying and absolutely fits. <laughs> yep. Like, like the, the picture in my head, like the version that has been crafted in the real world now, is so much worse than I imagined. Like. <laughs> It's that sort of that dual image almost of like, hey, I'm happy, but not really. I'm happy, but I want to hurt you. Yeah, I'm happy because of that. <laughs> I'm happy like, because hey, I will hurt you. Look at the madman smile. Look at the madman smile. Come have a ride <laughs> on my train. Because <laughs> that, that picture on the front of the book is him when he's finished then, when he's in the amusement mm-hmm. park running around and he's got mm-hmm. what he wanted. Yeah. And it's that smug kind of yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sound, the, 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 that sound that Patty just made is exactly the way that that, that, that he looks in that picture. Oh, it's horrible <laughs> with the teeth, yep. and the horrible eyes, and just that look, like the side eye look. He's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Jeremy, choo choo, choo motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> I know we talk about. I know we bring up Dark Souls a lot on this podcast, but the teeth and I, I, ne- I didn't put it together when I first got the book. It was only just now that I did it uh, look exactly like Framp's teeth, one of the primordial serpents from Dark Souls one and three. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's it's just these giant oversized teeth and something that should not have human teeth. Like It's the most <laughs> terrifying thing ever. Yeah, that <laughs> that that is excellent uh, shorthand to make something visually upsetting is to give human teeth to things that do not that ought not have human teeth like a dog with human teeth is one of the most upsetting things i can think of actually it's really gummy teeth as well like there's lots <laughs> of big gaps between the teeth that's awful yeah and also his gums uh the top and bottom gums meet in a way that yeah, Dax's teeth i don't would like not... that at all <laughs> no <laughs> that's not good i just I, I don't want to picture the <laughs> of every of every mouth flap that he does no no sir i don't want it <laughs> well, maybe Cole, Charlie the wanna, uh... sounds like calf then maybe he sounds like france <laughs> Don't ask me silly questions. <laughs> <laughs> you could never be blame the train. <laughs> you sorry fool. You were I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to correct you or anything, but um, I actually googled dogs with human teeth, and it's uh, it's surprisingly less creepy than you would think. All of these dogs look, seem so happy. <laughs> they're, they're so good. Okay, well, these are all great dogs. <laughs> is, well, there's no such thing as, as a bad dog. Um, but... Why is that the first suggestion? Dogs with H, and it just. <laughs> yeah. We are not the first ones to, to travel down this road, Patty. This is no. This, like, apparently, this is long, long and storied history. This is this is still upsetting, Jeremy. I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, question your internal barometer for what things are disturbing or not. Um, yeah, this is not. Uh, 
I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm still not into it. <laughs> oh, I'm looking at this before I go to bed. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a great. These are good logs. Like the little oh. bug at the top on the grass. Like that dude's a good yeah. dude. Well, oh, it's not. It's not the dog's. It's not the dog's fault. You know, it's it's the photoshoppers. I just think that the uh, the the entire thing together doesn't doesn't put together a good look. Okay, I fixed it. Look at sharks with human teeth instead. They're way funner. They're just <laughs> oh, goofy, yeah, goofy fish fun. boys. <laughs> Why is that also the first suggestion? <laughs> <laughs> is this a fetish? Did we find a fetish? Oh God, I hope uh, not. Yeah, this is the, the, the this is better. There the, there is some kind of like correction or just uh, just kind of like a regression to the mean that happens with human teeth, depending on how scary uh, the actual animal is. I've also huh. got Gary Busey with shark teeth. Nope, nope. Yep, yep, <laughs> found that. Also, also cat with shark teeth, which looks exactly I'm... the same as Gary Busey with shark teeth. So <laughs> I'm closing these tabs no, now. No, no, no. <laughs> So, um, Jake has read this and he decides, okay, I'm going to go to sleep. And he, you know, uh, is dismayed to find that the, uh, the key, uh, that the, uh, the voices are coming back, but he finds that holding onto the key makes those voices go away. So he goes and grabs the key, you know, from, from its place inside the, uh, the Charlie, the Choo book. And the last thing that he does in the last act that he, you know, commits kind of before he decides to, uh, you know, head off to Midworld is to send a thought to no one in, to no one in particular saying, you know, tell him to grab the key. The key makes the voices go. Which... Did we specifically mention that when uh when his when Jake's terrific <laughs> young boy day started earlier that hit the, all the voices were gone and nobody was talking in his head anymore. And Oh yeah. Yeah. Like when, like when he, okay. uh, <laughs> when, when, when he, when he walked by the lot, all of the, uh, the voices disappeared. And so when he picked up the key now and those voices went back away, cause they were kind of starting to come back up. Um, mm -hmm. I, it, I, I really like this. Like the, the analogy that he uses in his head is that these two men arguing in a room and then, um, there's a parade going by, so they stop arguing and just to go look at the parade, and like that's what's happening in Jake's head. And again, just feeling so sympathetic for Jake, and finally at this the end of this, picking up this key and those voices quieting down is just so, like I almost like breathed a sigh of relief at at the end of this. It's like oh thank God, yeah. like he can rest finally. <laughs> he's uh, he's found his talisman. Exactly. Yeah, and Roland doesn't have his yet, but he might later on. Yeah. Um, so final thoughts about this. Uh, Patty, how about you? Okay. Um, well, like, my favorite character in the books always changes with each book so far. Like, in, in Drawing of the Three, like, Eddie is my favorite character. Of course. In, in that book, because Eddie's great. In in Wastelands, uh, Jake is my favorite. Um, primarily for this chapter. Like, it's so different, this one. Uh, it's, uh, like, compared to... I mean, it's a very out there series, but this this whole chunk was just so different for me. Like it was such a, a departure from, you know, the boys on the beach. Here we go again. Um, and I just, I love the way that they portray Jake losing it, but better than how King does it with Roland. Like with, with Roland, mm -hmm. he's like, he's just going mad. Like mm -hmm. He's just like, he's dead. He's alive. He's dead. He's alive. Oh God. Yeah. Whereas Jake's like, I suppose dead half isn't as kind of forthright. Cause Roland would still be here. If thing was dead or alive, Whereas Jake was dead, he wouldn't be sitting in his classroom right now, you know, he'd, he'd be gone. So he's kind of got the real memories and then the fake ones that are kind of in there at the same time. Mm. Um, and the way that they, the King's keep saying day, the way that King explores it uh, and kind of spreads it out and shows it kind of growing and watching it slowly kind of making Jake break almost near the end. Uh, and then that moment where Jake's like, you know what? No, I'm going true and I'm fixing this. I'm mm -hmm. taking this one. I think that's where Jake becomes like the Jake that we're going to see later. That, that moment of, Nah, nah, not having this anymore. I'm doing <laughs> something about this. Uh, and just that transformation from, like, messed up kid to guy who yells at his dad. <laughs> Go on, mate. Yeah. Like, just ripping his hand off. Like, oh, just, you just, like, you just want to applaud. Like, you want to just yell at him. Like, go on. Like, we're all behind <laughs> you, man. Yeah. Um, and, and all the Charlie Choo Choo stuff, just, like, on a first read, because my first read's still quite fresh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> was the best is the best analysis i could have given then uh having read a bit further now and getting it like it, it does set up a lot of stuff uh like like you say like take a lot of notes in this section because yeah. i think you'll thank yourself later because <laughs> things that i didn't realize were significant that it's all spelled out here 
uh anyway that's pulling too much but it, it's it's far more prescient than it looks yes but yeah good chapter i think it's my favorite chapter of this book just yeah jeremy how about you uh, I full agreeing with with Patty, which is the first time that's ever happened. So <laughs> oh this God, this is remarkable in a podcast. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go kill myself no, now. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, you're the worst. Um, <laughs> it's it's just so much. It, like I, I hesitate to even call it fun to read, but it's it's just such a it's it's so interesting to read. Like Jake completely breaking down. It being almost solely focused on Jake. Like we get bare, I don't think we get any kind of Roland or any kind of um, Eddie or Susanna thing and that's remarkably different from the series so far like we haven't just really focused solely on Jake outside of the one one time and you mentioned at the very beginning of the podcast call that Jake is a much more fleshed out character now and it really really shows he's got like these characters that are around him his mom and his dad and his um, housekeeper he's going to kind of carry those people with him but he, he's completely separated from the world and just waiting to go and I, I don't know like it at a young age at 11, 12, 13, however old, however old I was when I read this, like there's a, I remember feeling that same urge of not quite fitting in into my environment. Like everybody played football and went hunting and I was like, let's play Nintendo and read weird fantasy books. <laughs> and so like having that desire to get away, I, I, I really, really identified with. And then just the duality of everything that's going on in Jake's head and having to basically remember himself dying over and over and over again is so horrifying without being, even graphic or gruesome like it's horror without any of the actual you know gross stuff like it's not it's just it's just <laughs> scary and that you know it's weird to think of Stephen King as a as a horror author nowadays because he's he's not really writing supernatural stories anymore but it's this kind is the kind of stuff that sticks sticks with me for years and years and years this is imagining Jake having to deal with this thing that's happening in his mind and basically nobody can help him and, and like and like Patty mentioned, like this book is just phenomenal for the rest of the book. It doesn't slow down. Like we're going to continually kind of ramp up stuff until the very end when it literally throws you off a cliffhanger. Yeah. In, in a way, it actually literally throws you off a cliff too. So <laughs> <laughs> um, it's 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 just it's just really good. I'm glad I'm on the next chapter too. Yeah. I don't know if I can confess that, but <laughs> everything works out. I'm on the next chapter, so yeah. I can talk about it more. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> to see where those merge. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know. I don't have anything to add really on top of that. Like this is, this is really great. It is its own self self-contained thing. It's great to see Jake get his own voice um, and get his own, get his own time in the spotlight. What it seems like is when King initially wrote the, uh, you know, the, the, the gunslinger, you know, that version of Jake, he was drawing from his own kind of experiences a little bit or some suppositions about what it might be like to, you know, grow up uh, with Jake's upbringing but by the time this rolled around, you know, his own sons were Jake's age, you know, and had been for, you know, a little bit. So, like, more experience makes you write different kinds of characters that don't resemble you better. And I think that just it it, it is it is a sign of, you know, King's maturity that he can come in and get this. Uh, Jake's function as, you know, the ultimate bullshit um, kind of censor, even beyond Eddie. Um, you know, Eddie is kind of always more of a, um, audience surrogate, um, in the, uh, in, in the books, you know, like everybody wants to, or I don't want to make suppositions. I want to identify with Eddie because, you know, he is very quick and very much the first person to respond to something in a way that, you know, somebody who came from relatively modern times would. Jake is very much a little bit, you know, the heart of things because he does have a sense of, you know, the way things ought to be. And we get a sense of that here when he is willing to rebel against his father, when he, you know, has these two, he has these two um, kind of disparate realities in his head. And he, you know, actively decides to go after, you know, the one that is not comfortable, the one that he doesn't know because he knows that it is, uh, you know, it, it is not right. It is not true. Like he is a really good character and like this is a great reintroduction of him. You know, alongside all of that cosmic horror and stuff that we talked about. Agreed. Jake 2.0. <laughs> the relaunch. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now thank... with a subscription service. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it is Jake as a service. <laughs> um, but um, thank you everybody for listening uh, to uh, to this episode, and also thank you Jeremy and thank you Patty uh, for uh, for coming along. Uh, where can we find you, Jeremy? 
Um, I have a Dark Souls podcast called Twin Humanities that me and my friend um, CJ do. <laughs> we uh, we kind of just talk about the games, and sometimes we do a podcast called On the Humanities where we just talk about like. You know, just media books and comic books and stuff that we're reading. And it's, it's a good time. You can check us out at uh, twinhumanitiesnexus.tumblr.com. I can't believe you've done this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Patty, where can people find you? Uh, the worst part of the internet. Uh, I run a, a blog called darksoulshaters.tumblr.com where I collect all the <laughs> wonderful hate mail I've collected. Uh, I'm part of the Dark Insight podcast. Uh, I do this little show called Don't Give Up Skeleton where I just talk about Dark Souls for a long time. You shouldn't listen. That's it's a good just one. too long. Yeah, uh, it, it go, it's, there's too much of it, really. Um, you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't find me because I'm terrible, terrible, terrible. <laughs> Can you tell you what brought us yourself. all together? You did that to yourself, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you can find me on uh, other shows on the uh, the duckfeed.tv network we are supported on patreon uh patreon.com slash uh slash duckfeed tv we're rolling out some changes that will not affect this show uh but will um you know make things a little bit cooler like if you like the show and you want to hear it a week early that's gonna be starting toward the end of june so uh pay attention to that uh again patreon.com slash duckfeed tv yeah um but otherwise leave us a review and be sure to tune in next time and tell your friends uh am i forgetting anything fellas Mm -mm, i don't think so so until next time long days and pleasant nights 